Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming here in the morning after yesterday's dinner. <laughs> um, so I come back to the beginning. Where are we currently standing? Um, this is the persistence uh, pipeline, and we start with a data set. We create some filtration of topological spaces out of it, and we compute a persistence module. Having the persistence module, uh, we, if we do this over one parameter, uh, we can compute the barcode, which we saw is like the decomposition of this module into its indecomposable summons. Every indecomposable summon is given by an interval. The barcode is just a collection of these intervals. And this is basically the story from here to here. We did everything there, yeah? Uh, except there was one thing that Frederick mentioned in his lectures, it's the elder rule. And he, he gave many pointers to what Thomas will be doing. And I'm, I'm a bit resistant. I, I will not do everything that he said I would be doing, uh, but for today, for now, I would really like to explain this elder rule in detail and from a uh, perspective, we can really understand it from representation theory using the, the machinery that we de developed so far. So this is really the, the goal uh, from a representation theory perspective, really understand that what they call the elder rule, okay? Um, so let me go into uh, and okay and after that we move on so let me go into the um uh, right spot namely <clears throat> so elder rule is something that applies when we compute uh really the homology uh of such a filtration of topological spaces and and to really get into it, I need to recall in more detail uh, how do we actually compute homology. So I try to give a little uh, ten minutes uh, overview, or maybe I run I run an actual example computing homology because everybody said, "Have you have you heard about uh, homology?" Yes, and 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 then we can then we move on. Okay, so. Uh, but I, I, read, I really need to go into detail now to, un to understand uh, the computation and to understand where this so-called elder rule applies. So let me do, hello, there's a visitor, so let, let me do that. Um, so we start, um, we start with a filtration of topological spaces, no. We start with a filtration of simplicial complexes. I mean, the easiest way to define homology if you have a simplicial complex. So we start with a with a with S, a filtered simplicial complex. This means I have a chain of simplicial complexes, S1, S2, up to Sn. Uh, so this is a, a, a linear filtration, an An filtration. You remember An is this uh one goes to two goes to three and so on uh, so i have such a scheme of filtered uh, simplicial complexes i apply uh, the functor computing piece homology to that filtration and that turns every complex into a vector space and every inclusion into a linear map between the corresponding vector spaces so i do obtain that thing here which is really a representation of this quiver of type AN. Yeah, so that's really what we want to discuss. How is that done in detail? Okay. Um, so this is the this is the story from from representation theory perspective. Really, uh, so this this is me. I, I start with a filtered simplicial complex. I compute homology. This is a module. So I I don't expect to go into the details, I ask the people in the TDA com community, give me the module, this this one here, this is a module over a quiver that I know very well, 
And then I decompose it. So given this module, I decompose the module uh, into its indecomposables. The indecomposables are intervals, so I can compute the barcode. Okay, this is how I see it from my perspective because I'm, I'm living here, I do quiver representations. However, uh, this decomposition of a module into indecomposables is not the most efficient one. Uh, maybe you saw yesterday, I gave you a, a little, little example of a module which, which has two indecomposable summons. It's in general not so easy to find out uh, what are the indecomposable summons. We cannot just guess it because there's exponentially many possible combinations. We need to analyze the endomorphism ring and maybe you found out this can be a little bit painful. Yeah, and, and not not only for you, it's also computationally expensive. Uh, there are some general tools uh, for a general quiver theory. I, I give it a module and it would decompose the module into its indecomposables. This is available, uh, a software package uh, in GAP. Uh, but it's, it's slow, it's really slow. So when I have my original in the, in the TDA pipeline, when, my, when I have a data set of, of uh, less than 100 points, uh, GAP can deal with it, yeah? Uh, but 100 points, uh, this is a joke. I mean, you don't, you don't do data analysis for 100 points, yeah? And, and for real life uh, applications, it simply doesn't work. Yeah? Uh, however, um, in the persistence theory community, they tell me uh, they, they, they do not go this way around, yeah? Actually, they do not compute the module. I, I, was, I was organizing a workshop between TDA and representation theory in, in, in Banff earlier this year, and I approached the people from the TDA community and I asked them, I want to do some tests in the summer uh, on some new invariants. Uh, so can you give me um, the, the module, this guy? And if I ask, give me the module, then I mean the vector spaces and the linear maps between them. And then I can run my tests. And they said, we, we, we don't have the module. Yeah, we, they, they don't actually compute the module in terms of linear maps, in terms of matrices between vector spaces. And I'm a bit uh, surprised well, how, how can you decompose it then I mean if you don't know the module how do you can decompose it so they they do this one here in one step I mean given the filtration they compute the barcode directly uh, so somewhere in the background yeah they they would have computed the module but but really the algorithm uh, turns out the the decomposition right away so they compute the module and its decomposition in one step and that can be done quite efficiently. And I want to run uh, an example to convince you this is actually something you can do quite efficiently. And uh, quite efficiently meaning, uh, I was attending a, a seminar in, in Japan of, of, uh, of a person um, analyzing uh, what, what they call massive voxel data. So they do three dimensional medical scans and they have, because we were discussing the, the limitations of TDA, but uh, they do uh, analyze three-dimensional medical scans with, with billions of, of uh, picture points, with, with billions of voxels, and they run the, the persistence uh, computation on those data, and, and it, it works, yeah. So, they they do not do simplicial complexes. They use cubical complexes, which seem to be better adapted to the three dimensional images, and and they uh, there's a lot of zeros in these matrices, and they use all that uh, to to speed up the computation. But this can be done very efficiently, whereas my decomposition here takes a lot of time. So that's the message. Yeah. So let's go into one concrete example to compute the homology. Are you ready for this? Good, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
so I, I want to simplify my life a little bit. Uh, let's say we work over Z2. Uh, I want to avoid any problem with signs. If you ever, so if I ask a question, who has, who knows what is homology? Everybody said yes. Who knows what is homology? Yeah. Uh, so you do know there's an issue with signs. Mm -hmm. I want to avoid it. So let's work over the field with the two elements. That's fine. And um, and and I also do assume for the moment that my my filtered simplicial complex is a, um, is a sequence of simplicial complexes, uh, an increasing sequence. So at every step, I add some more simplices, and I want to assume that I add one simplex at a time. Yeah, I mean, if I add in principle, I can add three or five simplices, but I, I kind of give me a finer filtration. So I, I add one simplex at a time. So my, my simplex SI will be just uh, given by simplices sigma one up to sigma i. And then I add one more, then I get sigma SI plus one and so on and so on. So every step I add one simplex. That's good. Uh, good. So. We didn't talk about simplices in general. So what are the zero simplices? These are just the vertices, okay? Vertices are the zero simplices. Edges are the one simplices. Triangles are the two simplices. And since I compute homology only in degree zero and one, this is all I need to consider, yeah? If you compute homology in degree zero, actually you deal only with vertices and edges, you just have a graph. Yeah, so your simplicial complex, if you're interested in H0, is just a graph. That's good. Okay. And uh, so what are we what are we doing? So we 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 define ourselves, we give ourselves some some maps. They are called the, the boundary maps, boundary operators, uh, from uh, degree i simplices to degree i minus one simplices. Uh, so say what is the map from one simplices to zero simplices to the edge between X and Y? I associate the sum of the two vertices. Okay, so this is the boundary map, the boundary operator delta one. You you know you have seen this. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so you notice that I'm cheating a little bit because this here is not an element in the set of zero simplices. It is a linear combination. So formally, I give myself the vector space, which is spanned by the zero simplices. So I'm able to write down that sum here. That's okay. Okay, very good. And the same thing I do for the two simplices, meaning, meaning the triangles. When I have a triangle, I want to attach to the triangle. What is the boundary of the triangle? Yeah, these are these three lines here, these three edges. Okay, so to, to the triangle, I attach the sum of the first, the second, and the third edge that we have here. That's all what I do. And, and to the zero simplices, I also define a boundary operator, but there's no negative one simplex. So I send everybody, every vertex goes to zero. That's good. So these are my boundary maps between the simplices. We are all good. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, I don't orient because uh, let me come back to this in a second. Yeah. Um, I want to keep it simple. I want to save myself some problems. Uh, so let, 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 let's look at that, okay? What I, what I really want is that I get a complex. What I really want is that delta square is zero. That's the important property of that construction, yeah? Because when I do know that delta square, when I apply this boundary operator twice, uh, delta square is zero, meaning the, the image of delta P plus one is contained in the kernel of delta P. Then I can form the quotient kernel over the image. I really need a complex. I need delta square to be zero in, able to, in order to be able to form that quotient. So this is really the property I'm after. 
uh, the composition of two deltas is zero. Okay, so if I look at my simplified version over Z2, what happens uh, if I start here with a vertex X? Uh, the vertex X will be adjacent to two edges. It appears here and it appears there, right? And then I map it along the next operator delta one, I get two copies of X on the other side, right? Uh, but the two copies of X over the field with two elements, they are zero, good? So going from here all the way down there, the composition is zero. Now, if I were working not over the field with two elements, I would have to introduce some uh, uh, some some well designed signs into the whole story uh, in in such a way that the composition of these two maps still uh, is such that uh, they cancel out if I go if I apply two times delta and in order to do so I would need to do I would need to introduce an orientation here to say who is the first who is the second who is the third edge and blah 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 but you save me all this. You're, you're, you're okay. I, I don't want to get, I will make a mistake anyway. So let's say we work over Z2, we have no signs, and just X appears here twice, and two times X is zero. Everything works fine. That's good. Okay. And you have seen the, the more sophisticated version with the signs. Yes. So you, 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 you know it works in general also for general characteristics. Okay, so this is good. So we, we know what is homology. Mm -hmm. And we know how to compute it. We need to compute uh, a quotient kernel over the image. This is linear algebra. We can do it, right? And, and to, to see what's going on, it's good to see that uh, H0 counts uh, counts the, the number of connected components, yeah? Um, because when I, when I form this quotient for H0, I mean, uh, uh, H, H0 here will be, uh, what is the kernel of, of delta zero? Yeah, the kernel of delta zero is every, is everybody. So H0 will be just, uh, given by the space where I quotient out by, by the image of the preceding map, yeah? And the image of the preceding map is whenever I have an edge, uh, I want to identify these two points. I mean, in the quotient, these two points will be equal. So in the quotient, X will be Y. So this means whenever I have an edge, I, I, I will identify the two points. I, I contract edges. So what I count at the end is really connected components. Yeah, so this is H0. You're good? Okay. Now let's run an example. Here's my example, and, and you can help me. Okay. Uh, so here's my, here's my filtered simplicial complex. Uh, I have a filtration. I mean, I have my simplices. S1 is just a vertex. S one and S2, sigma two is the vertex two. And then I add vertices, then I slowly add some edges, five, six, seven, eight. And then I add nine, then I add two triangles, 10 and 11. And I, I slowly build up my simplicial complex that you see here. That's okay. Uh, so I want to record, I want to define now my whole map delta. Let me let me put uh, all the delta i maps into one big matrix. Let's let's write this down at once. Yeah, so delta zero, delta one, they will all be there. Okay. Uh, so can you help me? What is uh, what is delta doing? What is delta doing? So delta zero is doing nothing. Delta zero sends everybody to zero. Yeah. So what is the matrix representing delta zero? It's all made up of zeros. I don't write it down. Question? So exactly, it just means the, the boundary maps for S and not take the filter from S. 
um, I mean, the, the filtered, the filtered complex, uh, I mean, S is, uh, S is e S is the system of the filtration. So I, I write here the, uh, I mean, S1 goes up to here, S2 goes up to there, S3 is here, S4 is here, S5 up to S11. And, and so the matrix will slowly build up. And, and I just write the biggest matrix of all of them. Yeah. yeah? Makes also because it's a, I can I can I can I can I can add an edge only if there were two vertices already present. Yes. I cannot add an edge in, in thin air. So first I need to have some vertices around before I can add an edge. So I can do this from left to right if I start my my labeling in, in such a way that the the vertices are there before I introduce an edge. I need to take care of this. Yes, thank you very much. This is good. Mm -hmm. So I'm still waiting for some input. Give me any value of any boundary map. Okay, so so what is what is delta one of the edge of the edge five? It's one plus two. It's okay. one. It it it's it's one plus two. I mean one and two are the two vertices. Uh, uh, that are the boundary of the edge five, yes? So in the matrix representation, one plus two would be two entries, one and one in that column. Do, do, do we all agree on this? Okay, so this is my matrix representation of the map that sends five to the sum one plus two. I the delta one of the simplex S five is the sum of the simplices one plus two. Yeah, this is your choice of linear algebra. Let me do it. Let 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 me do it this way. Okay, good. Thank thank you. Yeah, yeah that's okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, please continue. So uh, six goes where. Three and two, six goes to to three and two. Yes. Uh, seven goes where? Four and three. Eight goes where? Four and one. Nine. Nine goes where? Uh, three and one. Uh, ten. 10 is really the triangle here. Yeah, what are the, what's the boundary of 10? 10 is seven, eight and nine like this. And 11 is what, you can help me. Uh, nine, five and six. So this is good, this is our matrix, yeah? This is our matrix representing delta. So, so really, I mean, delta goes, uh, delta, delta one goes from the, uh, from the one simplices. So from the edges, the edges go from five to nine. So this is delta one, and this goes into the, the zero simplices. So delta one, uh, sorry, delta one would be really, delta one would be kind of. Uh, this part of the matrix, right? So that, uh, sorry, so that part would be delta one and, and delta two would be, would be sitting here. So my delta I, I can, I can record them in like into one matrix. That's okay. Because uh, some of you were asking, so how do we compute uh, H zero, H one and so on? We actually compute them in, in one stroke, in one matrix. We put all the delta I in one matrix and then we iteratively form from those quotients, okay? So the matrix uh, that we get is hopefully this matrix, if we made no mistake. That's good, I prepared this before already, okay? That's good, uh, fine. So this is our, uh, our map 
a delta and now we only need to form the quotient uh, image of delta i plus one over the kernel of delta i okay this is how we co compute homology so computing homology now i come back to your filtration question uh, so let's visualize this a little bit i mean my my s my s my s4 here is the same is the is the simplicial complex when i go when I introduce the first four simplices, the first four uh, simplices, these are the first four vertices. So this one here is S4, you see it? Yeah. Uh, S5, I would introduce an edge. S6, I introduce two edges. Uh, S7, I introduce another edge. S8 is this one. S9 is this one. That's okay. So you see my sequence of filtered, my, my filtration of simplicial complexes. Yes, you see that? Okay, good. Uh, so what visually, if we forget the definition, visually what happens and if we know that, that H0 computes uh, connected components, I, I have four connected components from the start, right? Uh, then I contract an edge. I, I will have only three connected components. I connect. I contract an edge, another edge. I have two connected components. I have one connected component. I contract another edge. What happens here? I, I still have one connected component. I cannot have less than one connected component. And, and same thing here, I introduce sort of unnecessary edges. So this is now the, the challenge of finding out when does adding a new edge here, when does that contribute to a reduction in the dimension of H zero, yeah? And for this, you need to compute the quotient and and compute the dimension of the quotient yeah and for us humans uh, computing or for me computing the, the quotient is kind of more complicated than computing a kernel of a linear map but just because i'm i'm trained more to look at elements than equivalence classes and for the computer it doesn't matter i mean you you normalize a matrix you reduce a matrix uh computing quotient or computing kernel is the same thing yeah <clears throat> so that's 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 what we're gonna do. So we have we, we add those columns here, and kind of the question is, are they linearly independent? So that that does something, that does something new, this does something new, but adding eight is sort of in uh, linearly dependent on the previous ones. This doesn't change the dimension of the of the quotient. So that's what we do. Okay. Uh, to formalize this a little, uh, it's fine so far. To formalize this a little bit, uh, we want to do matrix reduction, okay? So we say uh, the matrix delta, so the, the big matrix delta here, we say the big ma this matrix is reduced if whenever we have two columns i and j, which, which are not zero, uh, then the lowest entry in the column number i should be different from the lowest entry in the column number j. So this just ensures that these two are linearly independent. Yeah. Uh, maybe in linear algebra, you, you want to produce some lower triangular form. Yeah. But it's actually not important if it's a triangular form. I mean, important is only that, that one measure like the lowest entry in the column is always is always different yeah then you can reorder them so that they are lower triangular form but that's actually not important yeah so the the important issue is that that the lowest entry in the column is new then it's going to be linearly independent of everybody that we have produced before so a matrix delta is in reduced form if it satisfies this property that sounds good yeah where where's the characteristic involved here? Oh, yeah. 
the, 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 okay, the, sorry. Low of I denotes the row of the, the lowest row where there is a non-zero coefficient in the column. If this non-zero co coefficient in the column is one or two or 17, I don't mind. Okay. It's a non-zero entry, sorry, yeah. So this is just a measure of, of, this is an index. This is a row index of the last non-zero coefficient in that column, sorry. That's good, thank you very much. Uh, so so we, we, we are given this matrix, reduce it, and reduce it only left to right column operations. We, we use column operations because then we move along our filtration. We want to keep the normal form for the, for the lower, for the smaller simplices, okay? We don't, we, we don't want to change that anymore. So we go column operations left to right, which means everything that we reduced already stays reduced. And then we go up in our filtration of the simplicial complex. Okay, so you can do this with me, please. Mm -hmm. We want to reduce that matrix now according to that definition. Um, okay, so what's, what's going on? So first there's only zero columns, no worries, okay? Yeah, uh, there are zero columns, zero columns, zero columns, nothing to do, okay? Then we introduce our first non-zero column, that one here, number five. Okay, we have one non-zero column, uh, no condition, everything is fine, we leave it, that's good. Uh, we introduce our next uh, column, number six. Okay, so the lowest entry of number six is here in row number three. <clears throat> the lowest non-zero entry in row number five is, uh, in column number five is in row two. These are two different rows, all is fine. This is reduced, good. Uh, I introduce column seven, the lowest entry is in a new row. Everything is fine, this is reduced, good. So what happens at when we introduce eight? You notice that eight and seven have the lowest entry in the same row. That's not good, we want to reduce it. That's good. Okay, so help me reducing it. Yeah. Just the sum of the columns five to seven. Yeah, so we, I mean, I, I want to, I want to get rid of this one here, right? I want to re get a zero here. So you do your normal matrix reduction. I mean, you, you kind of add uh, seven to here, right? So, so you, you move these two ones over there to get a zero here. I, I do modulo two, okay? You, you want to do minus, <clears throat> but I work over set two. So you I, I just add these rows and I get a one one here, but then this is, uh, then that is not very good because I have the one which is in the same row as this one. So I need to add six here. If I add six here, then I get one plus one is zero, but this one gives me a one there. So I add five to this one. And if I add five to this one, this cancels out and this cancels out. This is what you suggested, right? Okay, perfect. That, that, that's good. Yeah, so going from left to right, using the previous columns, we reduced uh, the row number, the, the column number eight, and it turned out it's all a zero. Okay, this is very good. And, and this really reflects what we have seen before that uh, introducing the, the, the edge number eight doesn't uh, change anything in the quotient because it was already connected here, it stays connected here, that doesn't change anything. Yeah, so, I mean, that was an unnecessary information if we compute number of connected components. So we do the same thing with the row number nine. Okay, row number nine, uh, who wants to help me, not you? Yeah. Row number nine, somebody else, come on, please. Uh, we have a problem here, we want to fix it because here and here they have the same low, okay? If they have the same low, what we do? Yeah, come on.
yeah we we add we add these two up six plus nine that's okay if we if we add them up uh, then we get a zero here so i do six plus nine but the six has also an entry there so i get a, a one one here and this is in conflict this is in conflict with the five so i need to add my five uh to the story and if i add five they cancel out this is what we get that's good uh so let's do the same with row num with column number i erase everything no uh let's do the same with column number 10 column number 10 has a totally new entry this is good and column number nine ah that's not very good i need to uh i need to change it so to the column number nine I add the column number 10. So this gives me one, one here. And, and this is good because now this is the lowest entry. That is the lowest entry. They don't need to be in lower triangular form. They are just in different row positions. I'm fine. This is good. That's okay. So what we get here is that our reduced matrix, uh, our, our reduced matrix is in is in such a form where we have uh, some elements in in the, the the leading the lowest elements in every column. They are all in different positions. That's good. That's what we achieved. You agree that this can be done basically as you reduce in the same time as you reduce a matrix. Yeah, this is matrix reduction. You just go from left to right. Yeah, it doesn't cost you a lot. It doesn't cost you more than normal matrix reduction. So computing homology is simply a matrix reduction. That's okay. And the barcode. So in, in reduced matrices, how you, you these positions you call the pivot, pivot positions, right? Uh, they will tell you what the barcode is. Yeah. <clears throat> so in our computation of 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 the zeros homology, um, um, what did we say before? Introducing this edge five between one and two would would collapse would uh, would would connect two connected components into one. Yeah would combine two connected components into one. So at the position number five, the two connected components uh, labeled by the vertices one and two, they join, they merge into one connected component. That's okay. And this corresponds really to the fact that in position number five, the, the two is matched into one. So there, there is an entry here, yeah? And what they tell you is really that uh, the connected component, which was born here at time two, is merged at time five, and is, it is merged at time five with the other component one, okay? So we lose one component. And what did Frederick tell you? The oldest lives the longest. You you keep the oldest one and you kill the younger one. That's what he said. I'm sorry for the violent language, but I just that's what he said. Okay. Um so if you this this means the component which was born in two, we end it before five. At five, it's not there anymore. Okay. So the the barcode is an interval this goes from two and it ends before five i have an open interval here yeah and in in our discrete setting ending before five meaning it lives from two until four yeah so the component born in two lives until four and there it ends so that entry that pivot element in the column five tells me I go from two to the thing ending before five. So two and four. That's good. Um, this pivot element is three and I end before six. So this is three to five. Here four 
ends before seven. So this is the interval four to six. You see what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And that was everything for H1 because H1 is living only here. Uh, H0, sorry. Sorry, this was H0. That was the story for H0, okay? And the story for, for H1 is the same story. I mean, I have these two pivot columns. I have these two uh, components uh, defining H1. And they, the, the component which is born at nine, it has to end before 10. So if it ends before 10, it will end at nine. So the component born in nine dies off immediately. So there's, a, there's an entry that shows up at nine and dies off immediately. And the other component is born at eight and dies before 11. So this lives from eight until 10, yeah? So that's how they do it. I mean, really, 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 they, they compute this matrix do a matrix reduction columns left to right. And then the pivot elements tell them, this is the barcode. They read off the barcode right away. And, and this is really the matrix of the delta i's. And we didn't really compute the module and the linear maps, yeah? We, we just reduce the, the, the matrix of the simplicial complex a little bit and we figure out, ah, that must be the barcode decomposition. That's how, that's how we do it. That's okay. And did we, did we understand, did we understand the H1? Did we understand the H1? Did we understand H1? H1, 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 H1. So at 10, uh, at 10, we create this triangle, uh, meaning Uh, here. So what, what about H? What about H1? H1 measures non-contractible circles, right? So at this moment, we created an, an H1. Do you see that? Uh, so at position S8, we created an H1. Uh -huh, yeah, this is consistent with our observation. For a nine, we create another H1. You see two non-contractible circles. Uh, that's actually not how we do it. I mean, here's the circle created by eight, this one. And then uh, to the circle created by eight, we create another circle by nine. So these are these two, okay? And then if we fill in the new, eight, uh, the new triangle number 10, this one, this is filled. So only one of the two circles will survive. And we do get... Uh, these two components as as h1 yeah that's okay okay and and you see uh for h0 you see a nice little merge diagram this is good and i'm talking a little bit to spend some time i now want to i now want to tell you um I now want to explain to you how we can understand this 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 elder rule really using a representation theory. And this is only two slides, but they are a little bit dense. I prefer to do this after the break. Yeah. So let's stop here. We come back to this after the break. That's okay.